has been frameworks used in the world in the field of public health and environmental health. And you can see they are pretty uh, similar, the steps uh, sharing here. Uh, this is from Australian and Health Council. This is US in the 1997. And this is kind of a red book for uh, risk assessment back to 1983. And the steps are quite similar here. And today I will introduce to you this uh, framework applied in the dowsing uh, scenario. So uh, the framework I introduced is the, um, uh, have different steps similar to what you already seen. Uh, issue identification, hazard assessment, exposure assessment, risk characterization, and through this, uh, uh, risk complications and uh, um, stakeholders investment. And uh, I have the pub already published this in the uh, a journal and you may read the full assessment uh, at this uh, reference. So um, the first part of risk assessment is issue identification and you already seen in the videos, Vietnam was a huge amount of chemical was uh, used by the US Army and uh, totally they estimate about 366 kilograms of dioxins already sprayed in the chemicals as a contaminant. And uh, Bienhua and Da Nang areas was used as storage areas. And these are uh, two out of seven prioritized dousing hotspots in Vietnam nowadays. And uh, different studies already undertaken at this hotspot, not just uh, sector and all, but uh, other like uh, HQ consultants and other Vietnamese and international scientists. They show the level of dousing nowadays in Vietnam in those hotspots still very, very high. Um, some samples of, you can see here, is the highest level of dioxin observed in the world. And uh, uh, usually international standards for dioxin used for agricultural purpose should be less than 10 picogram per gram. Picogram is very small amount, 10 minus uh, 12 grams, so a trillion uh, uh, part of the gram, so very small amount, and uh, should be less than 10, but you can see at this hotspot, the sample uh, analyzed with a very high level of dowsing. And in Vietnam only, they already identified about uh, more than 13,000 victims in one hotspot. So this is the airbase, and the <coughs> different organizations already take samples around in the airbase, and the uh, knowledge on eco health uh, of trust is applied because you can see in order to know where to take the samples, they have to know what the water runoff directions, where the ponds, where the river, where the beach, how the um, topography of the lands, etc., to take the sample and. Uh, the results show that uh, inside the airbase and some sample outside the airbase now still have very high level of dioxin. So uh, this is the picture I took before our interventions in Bienhua. And you can see this is the airbase and this is outside of the airbase and people still uh, raise uh, cattle um, and then people still fish in this pond and now with the intervention already uh, the banning of the fishing um, activities but before that people fish here raise chicken and uh, buffaloes and grow vegetables outside of the area. For the hazard identification so the word dowsing uh, usually we think of one chemical but it is in fact the name of the family of chemical with about 75 different uh, uh, compounds and only seven have the dioxin toxicity and the most uh, toxic one has the name uh, brief, uh, CCTG is the most toxic chemical ever made by human um, and with tiny amount we can our body can tolerate daily it is the classified group on carcinogens and the half life is extremely long as you can see here depends on the soil characteristics and the weather. Usually it takes about 25 to 100 years to decompose half of the concentrations. And as you can see, with very high concentrations of dioxin at the hotspot, if no intervention is undertaken, for example, to uh, eliminate the uh, remedy at the site, 
uh, then the, the problem will continue for many decades later and even centuries. In humans, you can see uh, the half-life in humans is also quite long, about ranging from 6 to 14 years to decompose half of the dark skin in our human bodies. And as the women, uh, people can uh, um, excrete dark skin through breastfeeding, mainly, so the dark skin will go to the children. There is a conflict between the, the list of dark skin uh, uh, proved to be associated, uh, the, the disease proved associated with dark skin exposures, and the Vietnamese uh, mili military of health uh, proved a list of 17 diseases, whereas the US um, Institute of Medicine they only um, recognized five diseases that are uh, surfacing evidence. Others they um, uh, classified as still limiting or susceptible, susceptible evidence only. But at least you can see here these are the five different diseases that are shown to link with Down syndrome exposure. For the dose response assessment of Down syndrome, you can see that the different organizations give different um, recommendations, but quite similar. So according to WHO, uh, the tolerable daily intake for this chemical is very, very, very small. Only up to four picograms of Down syndrome per kilogram of our body weight per day. So extremely small amount. Uh, for exposure assessment, this is the exposure pathway. I'm sorry we draw this in Vietnamese, but you can see here the dioxin in Asian orange and other chemicals can go through the, the air, the soil, the water, and people can be exposed to this chemical through thermal absorption. But this is very limited small amount. The main pathway is through consuming, eating the contaminated foods, uh, and the studies overseas show that about 90 to 95 percent of dioxin in our human body come from contaminated foods, and uh, this risk was not mentioned before this study. So in Vietnam, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, back uh, further, people just think that the risky populations are those of the world, the soldiers and their children. They didn't think about the people who live in the contaminated areas. Um, for the uh, level of dioxin in the foods, so international standards depends on the countries and depends on foods, but usually the level of TCDD in food should be less than 0.1 picogram per gram of food. And a studies Taken by, uh, undertaken by Sector uh, et al. 2003, he took 16, only 16 samples in Vietnam, and you can see the level of dioxin in foods in Vietnam, uh, at base and in the market, and uh, in Vietnam, like, have very high level. For example, the job, you can see that exceeds the status to nearly 3,000 times higher than the standards. <laughs> and similar uh, result of the for other uh, foods, and similar situation of the internal evidence. We also, uh, in our public health association, based on that results, we also conduct a study to see how local people, how frequent they eat the foods, and how they are the practice to reduce the risk. And uh, we uh, survey 400 households living at two to ten cents from what surrounding the airway, and we see that only few people knew where the dioxin was, how the dioxin could get into the body, and how to reduce the risk. They didn't know, and they didn't even half of the people didn't know that the area was polluted with dioxin. Uh, so they think of dancing was something in the past, in the, during the war <coughs> And uh, well, based on the recommendation by WHO, every day each of us can uh, tolerate one to four picograms per kilogram weight per day. And based on the result of uh, dancing in food uh, conducted by another sector, by different foods, this is the level of dioxin in this food. And you can see, in order to meet this recommendation, 
people living at this hotspot can eat only very small, small, small amount of food. For example, if the duck, if people only exposed to the dousing in the duck, then they can only eat 0.1 gram per 0.6 gram of duck per day. So if they eat um, one time per week, they can only allow to eat one gram to four gram of duck per week. Hmm. So do you think this is feasible, realistic? No, we eat half of the duck or a quarter or a third of the duck. It's time, right? I, I don't eat much meat, but I eat maybe at least 100 grams per meal, not, not 0.1 gram or 1 gram of duck is not possible. And people who live here, if they eat the food they grow, they are not only exposed to dousing in duck, but chicken, fish, uh, different uh, vegetables, if they don't wash them carefully, through inhalation, etc. So the total exposure is high. If they consume the food, they, they grow there. And uh, a study, other studies by sectors, this professor from US, but he has been here for many times and, and has so many publications about that in, in Vietnam. And he said, uh, he uh, showed that blood samples of people who live in Bien Hung Lake, surround here, and they consume the fish in Bien Hung Lake, have the average level of dioxin in their blood, 28 pt is picogram per gram, 38. But other countries like US, Australia, Canada, England, etc., the general population have dowsing level usually from 2 to 7 picogram per gram. So you can and also compare with the north, like in, they took the sample in the north and the level in Hanoi and other areas only 2. So you can see at this hotspot, the level of dowsing is the people who eat the fish and other foods. Uh, at the local areas is much higher than the uh, other populations. And people born after the war, after 1980s, if they live there and eat the things they grow there, the level of dancing is so high. So for risk characterizations, we summarize information uh, that already um, described in the first three uh, steps. And you can see that these are some of the um, information put for risk characterization. And uh, I, I will show you some of the um, calculation for uh, risk characterization here. So if for cancer risk, I calculate uh, simple by point estimate. So the cancer risk usually uh, calculate by this formula. You don't need to worry about this. But you can see here the interpretation of the result. If an adult like me, 50 kilograms, this was a few years ago, now I'm 53. <laughs> I eat 100 grams of duck per week. Or my, my daughter, she eats 50 grams of duck per week for a long time. Then the risk of having cancer is for 7.7% uh, yeah? So if on uh, 10,000 people, there will be 770 people who will have cancer if they eat the duck they raised in Jabatia. Of course, if they eat the duck from other areas, it's no, uh, not highlighted. It's only the ducks that raised there. And you can see, usually for Vietnamese people, the, the risk for, from exposing to all the colors is only 13. 13 to, uh, to 10,000, meaning every 10,000 people there will be 13 people with cancer. But if they eat the duck here only, then the risk is only 20, 20 times higher than the background level. Similar, similar calculation is done for free red chickens and other like fish. And very interesting, the study show that free red chickens, that the, the chicken run around, at very high level of dowsing, but the chicken in the case is okay to eat because uh, the, the, the chicken in the case is not exposed to dowsing in the soil and in the water. So another um, um, information, as you can see here, 
in on here based on the tolerable daily intake recommended by WHO, I can calculate for all the people who live at these two worst internet Indian ones, they can uh, tolerate in one year like they can tolerate maximum this amount of dioxin, whereas the total dioxin spray of contaminated at this air, that area is 660 grams. So you can see many times uh, higher than the, the, the amount people can bear. But of course, this uh, dioxin can be washed up to the sea when the rain comes up. And for Vietnam, all the Vietnamese population, now nearly 90 million people, I calculate every year we can tolerate about less than 4 grams of dioxin for all the people in one year. And the total of dioxin spray in the Vietnamese uh, environment during the war is 366 kilograms. So you can see this is extremely amount of uh, dioxin in our own environment. So there are some limitations and uncertainty in the risk assessment. So when you do risk assessment, it is important you identify what are the limitations and uncertainties during your estimations. And I already identified here. And uh, so for example, the study only based on small a study by Arnold with small sample. Like he only took 16 food samples in Vietnam. So this is not representative. But of course, you can see studies about vaccine is extremely expensive. Do you know how much to analyze a sample? Does he give a guess? A hundred dollars? One thousand dollars? Yes, now the, the price now is about one thousand, but back to that time about two thousand or fifteen hundred dollars per sample. So the study cannot be like thousand, the, the sample size cannot be thousand or more than that, so it's really very small. This is the limitation in the risk assessment. So uh, my current study, I uh, want to provide a better um, estimate for the risk at the both Vietnam and China hotspots. So I took uh, 61 samples, but the sample is pool sample, not just one fish. So I catch 10 different fish, mix them together, and make it one sample of fish. So now my sample, um, my current study, and I'm going this afternoon. Uh, I take the sample of different food, both low risk food and high risk food in Pinhua and Chanang Airways. And uh, I will uh, also survey how people consume the foods and I will provide an estimate the risk for the local people before and after intervention. And so I compare with a, a control site to see what are the difference of the risk. So that is the second part. And um, I know you are tired, but please stay with me for maybe 15 more minutes. I will share with you, based on that assessment, risk assessment, uh, what we have been doing in terms of risk communications. So the risk communication programs implemented in Pienoa Hotspot in 2008 and in Jiangnan in 2010 and uh, 2007 and 9 was pre and post uh, intervention surveys to assess our uh, intervention. And similar, 2009 and 11 was before and after assessment of the intervention. So uh, based on the result of uh, risk assessment, we did community um, consultation. And so uh, we uh, organized workshops with, with the local uh, people and local stakeholders to consult them. And very surprised, like related stakeholders, for example, Department of Preventive Medicine, Department of Health, at the hotspot, but they didn't know that the dioxin was there and the people was at risk and how to reduce the risk they didn't know. So um, the uh, public consultation of, of organization to develop a detailed risk communication intervention programs at the two hotspots. Uh, and the different materials, uh, risk communication materials was developed within uh, that year and for both hotspots. And you can see, uh, depends on the target groups, we have the uh, materials for the local people, we have materials for the, um, how are the, the uh, related <coughs> departments, etc. And even for the policy makers, um, like uh, people committees, etc. 
and uh, the we apply both direct and indirect uh, communications uh, channels. And uh, as you can see, the dioxin is a very sensitive issue. It not only has it's not only health aspect, but the dioxin has other aspects like the economy. Imagine if like we uh, lots of communications activity occur in Vietnam, that in this is dioxin hotspot, then maybe investment may be affected, for example. And also it has a political aspect, the relationship between Vietnam and US. And before 2002, this issue was not discussed among Vietnamese and US government. But since 2002, uh, they, the two countries organized a meeting together. And since then, the issue is more open and lots of studies have been doing uh, in the past 10 years. And uh, for uh, communication, like direct communication, we train groups of um, communicators or volunteers. And they went to every household living surrounding the two areas to communicate with them uh, what they should do to reduce the risk and also other uh, channels as well. Uh, so, uh, that as uh, some information about his communications, and I believe that you might have uh, questions, or if you don't have now, you should think of some questions. Um, every time I present, I receive so many questions from the audience. And uh, as I just share with you uh, this picture. You can see every time uh, the dioxin issue presented, always attract media attention. So this is the meeting between the US and Vietnamese um, experts. So we organize a meeting every year in August uh, to present the studies from both US and Vietnam. So to provide evidence for high um, people in the government to give the decision making. And uh, very carefully when presenting the results because everything you say has the impact. And uh, there was one person saying this quote, and I think it's very good, very appropriate for the dioxin issue. There is no simple profession and there is no easy answer for the dioxin issues in Vietnam. Uh, so uh, that was briefly introduction about our programs and now I will show you uh, some of the theory of core principle of eco health approach that you have been exposing since yesterday, how they was applied in this case study. So the like, things like uh, system thinking involve different related stakeholders from knowledge to action. I will discuss more about this, uh, transdisciplinary equity and other uh, issues like sustainability consideration. Um, for this study, of course, it's not simple. We have to think the dioxin in a very concrete, a comprehensive picture. And I can show you the picture the, uh, that we draw uh, in the TO2 um, course in the Pattaya, but based on our study. So you can see, uh, in order to study dioxin exposure, we need to consider many factors related to this issue. And uh, they are interlinked together. We involve so many different stakeholders. It's not only uh, public health experts, but different people who are involved in this program, uh, from the central and to the, uh, to the uh, community levels. So you can see different um, people were involved, and not just the local people like us or scientists like us but also the soldiers who live inside the airways too. So it's not easy. Different things was uh, implemented to maximize the participation story of the different uh, stakeholders. And a uh, program sustainability, because this is the first intervention program in terms of public health implemented in the country to reduce the risk of dioxin. So we considered how to make it sustain and how to assess it, if it is sustainable. And uh, we, uh, this year and uh, next year, um, I will do, I'm doing a study, it's my PhD research, to assess if the intervention program is at the two hotspots and still sustain. Whether people still know uh, how to prevent the risk, 
for themselves and whether they practice the, uh, the things they have been doing during the intervention. And uh, this is some pictures uh, I took a few, two, three months ago when I go to the field to collect the data. And some uh, pictures is very uh, questioning, questionable or should take the uh, attempt to pay attention. For example, this picture I took outside of the airbase at the gate number two of the Air airbase. But at the time we did our intervention, we didn't have information showing this area was also polluted. So no intervention was undertaken here. But now with the new scientific data, we know that this area is polluted. But people didn't know. So we still come to this lake, it's very polluted here, to harvest the vegetable. This picture I took at the canal that the water run from the airways out uh, to our side. And uh, because the fishing activities have been reduced since our, the, our interventions. But because of that, then people in the local area knew that this are polluted area. So they don't fish there. And the fish is so many. So the people from other areas, they come here for fishing. As you can see that within five minutes, these two people just with a simple net throw into the canal and can have this amount of fish and it was so heavy. I can say about five to ten kilograms really? of fish. But the thing is, people cannot put the sign here saying this is downstream polluted area. Hmm. They cannot put the sign everywhere in the city because people may be scared and they they might be think they can inhale the dioxin or something like that. So it's not easy job in terms of risk communication. So these two, these two persons, they are from the, that locality or they are from, no, they were from, from outside? from other district, but okay. still in the uh, Danang city, but not from other district. Yeah. So they come here and then, of course, they can uh, take the picture of themselves and maybe sell to the market or bring to other areas. Yeah. So uh, the intervention activities should think of other options to reduce this. And because the dowsing testing is very expensive, so they cannot take sample from every location in the city mm. to show the actual level of dowsing. But without that, the local authority cannot put the sign saying no fishing here because they don't have the data. So it's not easy to. So another the um, principle of the eco-health research is from knowledge to action. And you can see since 2002 until the time we did our study in Vietnam is 2008, the intervention 2008. <coughs> Before that, there have been many studies on the environmental uh, data, on the level of dioxide in soil, in mud, and hum human body. But no public health intervention was undertaken. So based on the results of previous studies from other organizations, we took advantage of that result to implement our intervention program. And uh, nowadays, if you uh, listen to the, uh, the television or the, the read newspapers, you can see that uh, remediation activities already undertaken. For example, in Danang, a project uh, funded last year and will finish hopefully in 2016, by US uh, AID, um, 43 million US dollars to remediate on site. And now the amount now raised to already 80, about 80 million already to remediate Danang site only. In Vietnam, it will take more money because it's bigger, the level of the contamination is more. So maybe it costs more time, money to uh, remediate the Vietnam site. So I mean, the, yeah, based on the scientific data, we took some actions which have to reduce the level of dioxin uh, exposure uh, and uh, hopefully could continue to other areas or even at these two areas, further study, further intervention should be doing because the level of achievement is not as we expect. So uh, that I, I don't know if we, I'm not too long, I aim for 45 minutes, but do we have time for questions? Of course, you, you know, you are perfectly in time and you have actually 17 minutes for question and discussion. Very good then. So, uh, you have any
any questions related to the presentations or just general questions about the issue in the country? So how much did it cost the, the intervention, so the study, the intervention you did with uh, the VPSA? Uh, this is not uh, to cheat the dowsing, so it's not expensive. In one uh, in one site, the fourth foundation funded uh, so 170,000 US. And in Janang, about 150,000. So totally about 300,000 for two sites um, to reduce the exposure outside of the airbase. But to keep the dowsing inside yeah, okay. the airbase is expensive. And the thing is, people cannot keep the dowsing outside of the airbase because now people.